Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. With me once again, my good friend, Deborah Marrow, certified Alexander Technique instructor. And I mean, this is the shit we talk about all the time anyway, <laughs> so why not? Why not do a podcast? Today's topic is on buying horses. So there's actually quite a bit to say because buying know. horses, yeah, like in my business, I don't buy and sell. I And I personally don't buy and sell very often. Um, but it's a big deal. And especially somebody who maybe rode as a kid and they're just getting back into horses. Mm. A lot of women, like, you know, the kids have grown up and gone and they can take Good on a point. hobby. And it's time to get back into horses. And the whole buying and selling of horses is what gives, what what creates that derogatory term that we call horse traders. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. So navigating how to go about buying a horse, we thought we'd do a podcast on that. And we'll follow up on another podcast with how to go about rehoming is how I like to call it or selling your horse if you have to. So anything you want to start off with, Deb, on buying horses? I'm, I'm, I'm all ears on this one because I think we have like minds in that, um, you know, my horses are pretty much for life. So yeah. it would have to be an extreme situation. Yes. For and me. I'm... And as you know, I have a life insurance policy for my horses. And as you know, my horses go to you if something happens to me. Yeah. So that's how yeah. I think about it. So it's been over 20 years since I was in buying and selling. Well, uh, that's not entirely true because Plumley is a new addition for you. Ah, he's so, been five. He was a gift. He was okay. A, he, free. Ha ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and most of the horses I've bought or taken have have I've literally stumbled across them I mm. think once I went out looking for a horse and that was my horse Mick he was the last one I sort of saw a video I really liked him went and looked at him and got him and I think that's the last time I went out and actually bought a horse all the other yeah. horses have just sort of well as a horse trainer they just cross my path or show up in right. my life and some I've paid for, some have been given to me. But once I own a horse, I'm one of those people, I just own them. They live with me the mm -hmm. rest of their life. I don't really consider selling. And as a horse trainer, it is not part of my business to buy and sell on commission. Mm -hmm. Like I just, it's not part of my business. And it's become a big enough problem in the industry that maybe five years ago, I want to say, maybe longer, my professional liability insurance as a horse trainer, they added a category that you pay extra insurance if you buy and sell horses. Wow. And I go, ooh, it's bad that's, out there. That's bad. <laughs> it's bad out there. And, and so they now, and they checked. They checked my website. They checked ooh. any listing. Because the only time I help put out sales videos is mostly if it's a rescue situation or if somebody doesn't want money for their horse or a lot of money, but they want to find a good home, then I will step that, in and help. That's spread, different. Yeah, spread the word. But I don't buy and sell. A lot of horse trainers make a good chunk of their income buying and selling horses with commissions. And I've always considered that a conflict of interest. Like, I just think it's riddled with problems to have the trainer make a commission off of a sales or a, or a purchase. I think it's kind of like selling your neighbor or your car, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you just shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because even if the best of intentions and disclosures, if they become unhappy, it's, it's finger pointing time. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting that my insurance company added that as a liability feature on uh, if you buy and sell horses, 
you got to check that box and you pay extra wow. for your insurance, for your liability insurance. And um, I thought, wow, it's really become something that even the insurance companies have clued into. So like, that's the first thing I want to say is if, if a client of mine is shopping for a horse, they can basically pay me for a lesson. I go, it's respectful to pay your horse trainer, your farrier, your vet for their authentic opinion on the horse that you went out and shopped for and looked for. Right. Right. I go pay the professional for their time and expertise and their knowledge, but not on commission. I go, as soon as you make that a commission, like some people think they'll point. pay more if they pay the professional by the hour for their authentic opinion. But I go, as soon as you have a commission involved, the person, the new potential horse owner is going to be sold a horse that is maybe too much horse for them, is more yeah. horse than they need because the higher the dollar value, the bigger the commission. So a lot of people get upsold oh, with wow. horses that they really don't, aren't a good match, let's say that. And ultimately the rider's experience as well as the success of the horse is really dependent on it being a good match between the horse and rider more than the breed, the age, is confirmation issues, lameness issues, behavioral issues. I go, if it's a good match between the horse and the owner, then a lot of that stuff can be worked out. Right. Right. So like the number one thing is try to avoid a commission situation when you're mm -hmm. buying a horse. Try to buy directly from the person who owns the horse or if it's a broker, and there are very good trainers and barn owners out there that take in horses, fix them up, and sell them. Nothing wrong with that at all, at all. The good ones disclose all of the problems and try to create a good match. Because right. hiding any problems that a horse has ultimately doesn't serve the horse. Because the buyer isn't getting what they thought they were getting. Right. Right. And I'm talking more about selling. I'll put that in the next podcast. But okay. it's like the first thing with buying is even if it's a broker, number one, you can ask for references. Whether it's Good a trainer point. or a barn or a broker, you can ask for references before you even deal with them. You can um, check with your, your current vet or your current farrier or your current trainer, or a trainer at the barn, and go, or a body worker on a horse, and go, do you know of any good horses on the market? Do you know of any good brokers? That would do be a good start. Know... Yeah, go to the people you're in your circle that you trust. Yes. Yes. And, and then, and um, my friend Michelle, who's actually looking for a horse, reminded me of this. You as the potential buyer have to think, what is it I want? What do I want to do with my horse? What yes. is a good match for me? What is my fear level? What's my confidence level? What do I want to do with my horse? Do I want to, do I really want to show? Do I really want to trail ride? Do I want to do a specific thing like dressage or jumping or eventing? is the relationship with my horse the most important component right and for a lot of women who are getting back into horses for the first time after many years being safe having fun and having a relationship with their horse are actually pretty high priorities yeah that's kind of where i'm at <laughs> yeah so why did you take plumley like why, why did you did I yeah, this even is a, though this he... is a perfect answer. It's okay. like buying a house because I've always wanted to have a halflinger. <laughs> there you go. And that's I why just most... think they're cute. <laughs> and I that was actually on my list. Okay. I go when people are out that's shopping cute. for horses, they're not usually thinking, is this particular unique horse a good match for me? 
they go out shopping for an age, a breed, <laughs> a color, color, <laughs> you know, and whether it's a super talented, it's like they're shopping for a sports car. And what they really need is a station, station. wagon or, a, <laughs> you know, they're looking for a I Maserati agree. and what you really need is a truck. And <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, the Maserati is really fun, but what you really need in your day-to-day -day life is something more utilitarian. And there was another reason. Um, I only had two horses and it was very difficult for me to leave with one horse. Right. And because of the other horse's safety issues. So a third horse helped the herd situation. Yes. And he, and I was, I was kind of looking at his energy. He was, he was, you know, neutral, calming, didn't need to be the leader of the pack. Yeah. Um, and, and having, a, as you know, finer things is a highly motivated mare to be in charge. Yes. So he had to fit in. And, and I actually asked for a 30 day trial. That's another way to do it. Yeah. And just said, yes. I just want to make sure everybody's safe. Everybody gets along. Yes. Um, and even if you lose money, even if you have to give a deposit and go right. back and try the horse several times, or you pay for a month's lease and you bring right. the horse home and try him out at home or try him out at the barn where you're going to board, all of that is money well spent before you commit to the horse. Like even to sort of buy the time, like an option to go back and, and put, keep you first in line for buying the horse, you might have to pay a fee for that. But I go money well spent. Yes. Money well spent. The other thing that a lot of people don't do, like when you think about what you as an individual, what is a day in the life with your horse? What does that look like? Right. Right. And you take that dream and you break it down and it starts to tell you what you're looking for in a horse. Good one. I like that. You know, and then you make a list of characteristics so you can look past age, color, breed, athletic, <laughs> current athletic performance levels. And you look for that match because you're going to be in a relationship with this animal, right? And right. you, there's going to be an adaptation kind of you guys have to get to know each other, live together a little bit. So the the best match is on an energetic or personality level. Mm -hmm. I go that you can't really train or change. But everything else you can kind of work through. Right. Right. And so really thinking about what is a day in the life look like with this new horse that I want to go out and find? That's the most important thing you can do. And then you can communicate what you want. If you have people who are helping you find a horse, you can really be clear on your communication as to what you're looking for. So you, you take responsibility to first go, what is it I really, really want? What's a day in the life look like? Why am I getting this horse? What, what am I picturing is going to happen? And then it helps you find a better personality match, which may or may not be the breed of choice that you had in mind. It, maybe the horse is a little too young or a little too old, right? Maybe the horse is, you wanted a Palomino and this horse is just a chestnut. And you're like, <laughs> you know, it's wrong color. And the first horse I ever bought, I opened the newspaper. I found the right breed, thoroughbred, the right color, dark bay. <laughs> and um, six over 16 hands. So I'm like sold, right? So I go to look at him and I knew nothing at the time. I was 16. And so they turn him out first and he goes bronking around the paddock and then they bring him in to saddle him up. So I'm like, okay. And then it was muddy. So they rode him in the barn aisle and he was like high headed racing up and down the barn aisle. And they couldn't get him to canter because he kept threatening to buck. And I'm like, sold. He's the right color. He's the right breed, right? And he was the right price. He was cheap because he was only 30 days off the track. Oh, Racing wow. thoroughbred, my first horse. And it was nothing but a huge learning curve that I lived through because I was 16 years old. Exactly. Right? And I go, that's how most of us go about getting our first horse. You know, Same we have- for me. 
no, we know nothing, right? So getting the opinion and it's like, if you have a vet, even if you have a small animal vet, your small animal vet might refer you to a local large animal vet. Get to know the vet and say, hey, I'm shopping for a horse, even if you're looking at a horse out of that vet's area. I'll talk about that in a minute. They might know somebody. Yeah. They might know of a good horse or they might know of a good horse trainer who's honest or a broker who's honest, who will really give you a good match. But going out to buy a horse, it's like hitting the jungle and, and you need it. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of need a Sherpa or a guide to help you and be willing to pay professionals for their time and try to avoid the commission. The commission yes. screws everything up. So that's like my first thing. Decide what you want. Find opinions and help as you're shopping. You know what I mean? Be open that the horse is going to be imperfect. Like there is no perfect horse. So what you're always deciding on a purchase is, is this set of problems that this horse is going to give me <laughs> a set of problems that I can cope with? Or is it and is it a big enough problem that I'm out of my depth? Right. right? Like if the horse scares you, you're out of your depth. Okay. Yes. You know, it's going to be really hard to work through a fear issue. And that might happen after the sale. And then you have to make the choice. Do I stick this out and learn and get help? Or did I make a mistake in my purchase? Wow. And that, you know, but every time a horse changes owners and changes locations, it's very stressful for them. Right. So I go, when you go to look at a horse with a new owner in a new location, you're going to have about 50% of what they're showing you that day with the known owner rider and the known environment. Right. So every horse, when they're freshly purchased, new home, new owner, they all have a setback because it's stressful. So you sort of look at the day you're looking at the horse or trying the horse, that's the best case scenario for that horse. That's a good point. Right. And you're going to get less than that upon purchase, move, relocation, new owner, new relationship. So you better be seeing what you want to see when you go for the sale. And any problems you see, consider that they may well be magnified. Right. Right. So if it's a small hiccup, you go, if that hiccup was exaggerated, could I handle it? Yeah. Or do I have somebody to help me handle it? Or yes. Or do I have a good support system? Yeah. Do I, I think that is the support system really matters, whether yeah. they're helpful or not, you know, because it can go either way. Right. Are they, and I look at the support system as, are they supporting my ideas, knowing yes. myself, what I want and what I feel good about, or are they pushing their agenda on me? Exactly. Because they want to make a bigger commission or they want me to go to a show and I'm not interested in showing, but that's where they make their money. You know, are they trying to get me into this horse so they can upsell me later? You know, it's like good there's point. a whole lot of different motivations, especially when commissions are involved that take away that sort of authentic going out and looking for like a new dog or a new cat. You want a companion, a pet, a relationship first and foremost. Unless you're a competitive rider and you're looking for a horse with more talent to go to a higher level, right. that's a little different, right? So then you might be dealing with, you go, I can manage that behavioral problem because this horse is so talented. I can get where I want to go competitively. Yeah. And that's why you have to picture what's your dream? What's your day in the life? What can you handle? And all of the purchase revolves around that. That's how you begin to find a good match. Yeah. And I'm I, your financial situation too. I mean, if you haven't been in horses for a while, you might want to check at costs. <laughs> Yeah, look at your cost, get a realistic view of what it's going to cost to keep and own that horse. And there is a there's a saying in the horse business from the professional side that, you know, most people go out and they think if I spend 30 or $40,000 on a horse, I'm going to get a really good one. And I go, 
not necessarily. I go, most people need a thousand dollars worth of horse and twenty nine thousand dollars worth of education. Yeah, that's and interesting. I go, you brought that up because um I was I'm involved in I just overheard this horse was being sold for thirty thousand. And the purchaser did their due diligence and you know, drew blood, had x-rays, had a pre-purchase exam. And it turned out he has got multiple kidney liver issues and you know, something you would, we're always looking for lameness, but you know. Or so, most people who don't know what they're doing are going out and seeing, is the horse doing the job that I wanna do at home? And that's right. the end of it. And I go, but there's multiple layers to every horse. So I go, once you decide what you want and you have a couple of potential horses or one potential horse that you really like, the most important part of buying a horse is pay the money for a pre-purchase exam. Yes. And it's called a PPE. Every vet does them. It can include multiple x-rays, drawing blood, running, you know, doing different blood panels. Um, it can, it will include a flexion test. It'll have the vet look it over, but a pre-purchase exam, if, you know, all the other boxes are checked, it's not uncommon, especially high dollar horses, horses that have been through a lot of training. It's not uncommon to find lurking lameness issues or weird health issues. Mm -hmm. And they, in this situation, they got the price brought way down and the new owners have decided to take care of his health before riding him. They want to get him managed better. Right. And I go, so that, they feel it's worth it. They felt they feel it's worth it. Absolutely. And I took on a horse that was free with bad x-rays but I evaluated the whole situation and who I am and what I wanted. And I took the horse with the known issues. Right. I go, it's not a deal breaker, but it's like getting a home inspection when you buy a house. Exactly. Get the, the entire picture instead of the dream picture. Get somebody because you can put paint on the house and fancy furniture and stage it and remodel but you've got termites or you've got bad plumbing. You have big electrical issues. You have a bad roof. Those are all the inspector is going to crawl around and look at that house's sustainability. Right. And that's what a pre-purchase exam is. Yes. And the key to that, if you're buying a horse that's out of your area, never, ever, ever use the vet that that barn or seller uses. You got to find a different one. Mm -hmm. You cannot. And even if you look them up on the internet or you get them through referral, but the vet relationship with the seller is sacrosanct. So I go, you, you cannot, as a buyer, come in and ask somebody's vet to give you a fully honest opinion, because if they blow the sale, they also blow their relationship with the seller, right. because they have their own professional relationship. So number one, get any other vet but the owner's vet or yes. the broker's vet or the barn owner's vet, get any other vet in the area besides that. Pay for the most pre-purchase exam that you can afford or that is, you know, the less, the less we know about horses as a buyer, the more we need to pay for the help. And it's yes. money well spent. Because if the horse like you're describing has some weird issue, liver function, who knew? Right? Who would have not, thought? Not something you can see a $30, from the outside. A $30,000 horse. Right. You know. And it, what I find is even if the horse is perfectly behaved and performing, that's going to wear off if there's an underlying health issue. The mm -hmm. behavior will go south. The performance will go south. And you're not getting what you think you're getting. If there's a health issue, that's going to override everything that the horse has learned how to do or every positive behavioral trait from the past. A health issue is gonna override it. So if you have your own vet who also doesn't share the same client, like if, here, if I were gonna buy a horse locally and my vet is also the vet for the seller, 
I would still go out and get another vet. Yeah, I would too. I would get a neutral vet. And then if I have a farrier, I would have my farrier take a look at it, especially if my farrier knows how to read x-rays, maybe looks at the feet more in depth or the legs, or I'm, I'm going to ask for opinions from people I trust right. and, and be willing to pay for them rather than pay a commission. Right. And I go, you may lose money up front, but you're going to wind up with a horse that you want to have for life. Yeah. Yeah. And every horse has issues. Like there is no such thing as a perfect horse. Yeah. I go, everybody has to decide on a personal level. Are these issues <clears throat> within my wheelhouse? Can I deal with this issue? And are there issues that I feel I can't deal with? Because that's I what gets <clears throat> horses sold. And the other thing I tell people about horses is finding a good horse for sale is tricky and it takes some time. And a lot of times it comes accidentally. So-and-so, no so-and-so, and and this horse crosses your path. But going out and shopping for a horse, it's it's buyer beware. Oh, I did that for a student a long time ago. And I think it took us the same thing happened. It was, we were six months into looking and then this horse just fell in our lap. Yeah. While we weren't looking. Because I got to tell you from a professional training background, I go, a lot of people are selling their problems. People aren't selling their best horses. That's a good point. You know, and some really common mistakes are a barn sells one of their lesson horse pro, you know, a horse that was in their lesson program. And they go, oh, this has been a lesson horse. Anybody can ride them. And I go, so why is it no longer in your lesson program? Exactly. And the reason is it's becoming a problem in the lesson program. So now they have the horse for sale. And I go off the track thoroughbreds, another classic. People think, well, this horse has been ridden a bunch. Off the track thoroughbred would be great. Take it home. I could go trail riding. I could start jumping. The horse is used to racing and being ridden. No. No. The horse is used to one way of life that's like a military life. And as soon as you pull that horse out of track life, you have a green horse. <clears throat> you have a, even on the ground. Even on the ground. It yeah. Is, is, can be very dangerous. Yeah. Because the horse doesn't not know. Not a priority any, at the track. Right. The horse has one job at the track, many right. different handlers, very consistent environment. And as soon as you change that and put them in your backyard, now they have one person and different jobs and they, they're like a, it's like an unstarted horse. You're basically an off the track thoroughbred. You're getting a pretty green horse as a pleasure horse or even as a show horse. You know, it's, you have to retrain every off the track thoroughbred. Yes. To get them to perform in life that is not track life. Yep. So that's another really common mistake or people going to rescues looking for an inexpensive horse, cheap horses and free horses usually take the most amount of training time and will involve some physical rehab. Yeah. Yeah. Plumley came to me with a spiral fracture on of one cannon bone and a torn suspensory on the other. And what was his previous job? Fox hunting. And yeah. So if he were still showing. a successful fox hunter, people aren't going to give up their good fox hunting horses. No. They sell the ones that aren't working. And I go, that's most of the horses on the market are on the market because they're not easy or good or there's some issue. Right. And, and so that's what you want to sort out is what's the issue? And is it an issue I'm comfortable working with or not, period. But most people, and, and I have to say, a lot of trainers who are working on commission or sales barns, they're trying to turn over horses like house right. flippers, right? And there are good house flippers who go in, fix the plumbing, tear down the walls, get rid of mold. And then there's other house flippers that put a coat of paint over a horse, over a house that's falling down. Yep. And you have to do your due diligence to know the difference because both houses look pretty and have what you want, 
but you have to kind of look behind the walls to see what's really back there. And so the same thing with trainers. And some trainers are trying to push, you need a young horse because they're not you'll have it yet. forever. Right. <laughs> I heard now, that one. <laughs> I go for women over 50 need horses over 10 for the most part. <laughs> Don't buy anything under 10 years old. And, it still and has a, really a baby good brain. Point. Um, what are you getting for your money? Because a lot of people don't want to quote unquote pay for that horse that's over 10. So they yeah. buy the younger horse thinking, oh, I got a good deal. Because I have longevity now. Yeah, but and, and I broken go, but... bones aren't in that picture, you know? <laughs> right, right. No, and a horse's average lifespan should be 30. Right. So horses age, like we say, dog years, I go horse years are they age about three years to every human year. So 30 equals 90. That's about their average lifespan. And my 29 year old horse is still being ridden and working. So it's and your horses are in their late teens. They're, yeah, let's see. Plumley's 24, finer things is 22 and Callie's 20, if you can believe it. Yeah, That's and how if, I know how long we've been together because I brought, <laughs> I brought Callie to you as a two coming three because I wanted young? you to start her and you went, yeah, no, she's not no. ready. <laughs> yeah, she needs a few years. She needs some growing up. <laughs> yeah. No, and some of the bigger breeds like drafts and warm bloods, we've talked about this before on podcasts, but the whole skeletal frame of a horse doesn't fully mature. It doesn't reach its peak maturity until the age of seven. So these horses that are outperforming high levels of competition at five, I go, you're also risking a horse that already has lameness issues and they're already getting joint injections. And yeah. you think you're getting a better deal because the horse is young and already performing. But I go, you're also risking that you have more significant health issues to deal with down the line. Down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And a 10 year old horse, a 10 to 12 year old horse should really be in their prime. Like yes. they're young enough. You have a lot of years left. You've got 15, 20 years left with that horse. And they're old enough that they're no longer just acting out foolishly. Their body has matured. Their brain has matured. If they're not dead lame, they've been ridden by 10 successfully by somebody good. Right. But a lot of horses that are pushed into high performance in order to make money, you get a higher sales dollar, younger horse, higher level of performance equals bigger commissions. And I go, that's exactly what gets pushed on people. But the body could have been so stressed that you're now going to have complicated health issues on the backside of that. Or um, I know with my big mare's uh, sire, he was campaigned because he had, you know, he had to go through all of the things to be a stallion. Mm -hmm. By the age of 24, he was crippled. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the injections just didn't work anymore. So a young horse does not always equal a higher value. If right. you can find an older horse that's been well-trained, they're still going to be sound. They're going to be really healthy. And you got a lot of good years left with a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, even if you get into the mid-teens. And if you're not a high-level competitive rider, it's a better match for most people that are pleasure riding or sort of, you know, doing lower level competition. It's right. a better match to get an older horse. And you don't like also... When you go out and you buy talent off of bloodlines mm. or you get this sort of prestigious bloodline, this uh, whether no matter whether it's a warm blood or a thoroughbred or whatever, the bloodline, a lot of people are looking for uber talent. And I go, mm -mm -mm. It, they're kind of like artists. I go, you get a lot of delicate temperament that comes with oh, I talent. I can attest to that. Yeah. The more <laughs> talent you have, sometimes the trickier they are to work with because with all that talent comes sort of just like we see with talented athletes, talented actors. It's like 
there's a little bit of instability and unpredictability. Like <laughs> just, just put it that way. Well, they can be prima donnas. Let's put it that way. <laughs> they can be super smart, super opinionated, and a little bit of a prima donna. And that's what just kind of comes with the talent. Yep. So they don't suffer the learning curve of most humans. When, no. the, when you get a really talented horse, they're demanding of the rider. You have to step up to their level of talent. Yes. So finding a horse that's sort of in the mid range of talent and sound, I go, that's a better match for most people that are learning to ride or they're in the medium level of riding. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not super advanced riders looking to compete at high levels. And then what you nailed right off the top, specific breed. I yeah. just give it the big fat eye roll. Like when people, <laughs> I can't help it. I nothing makes me roll my eyes into the back of my head more than somebody telling me that they want a specific breed, and they usually have the reason of it's docile or it performs better or it's a calmer breed. And I go, I've worked with explosive draft horses. Mm -hmm. I go, people think all draft horses are big and gentle and kind of doughy. And I go, oh, no, they're not. And when they blow up and when they bolt, it's a lot of horsepower. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of horsepower. You know, and some people think all ponies are for children. And I go, ponies what? are evil. <laughs> ponies can be evil. That's what makes those kids so hard. I know, but kids <laughs> still bounce. I go, you know, if your kid is 12 or under and falling off regularly, count your blessings because yeah. they're learning how to fall off better. But it's like, <laughs> yeah, ponies, not all ponies are for children. No. And some of them hate children because they've been sort of, you know, from their point of view, they feel tortured by children. Yep. And so not all ponies are for children. Sometimes an older big horse is a better kid's, kid's horse. Something that is older and calmer, relaxed, been there, done that. I go, old horses and young people are a very good match when it comes to beginners. That's a very good match. And it gives the older horse a great home, a lot of love, an easier life because the human on their learning curve kind of has to go slow to learn how to balance and, you know, learn as you go. So an older horse with a young rider is a good match. I've always thought of the saying, a yeah. Uh... Aged gelding goes great with a teenage girl. <laughs> yeah, because they're tolerant. Yep. Yes. And the girl's so just going to love on them, you know? Yeah. And the other sort of quip in uh, the horse trading business is green on green makes black and blue. <laughs> green rider, green horse, black and blue eventually. <laughs> I go yep. so... Yeah, you don't you don't want to go out. You don't want your teenager to learn how to drive in a sports car. Right. It's way too much power, way too sensitive of a car for somebody who's learning to drive. It's like you want the old car that takes a little more pressure on the gas pedal to get going, yep. you know. It, and and so specific breeds is I see that probably the most. People have I a see. romantic notion about a breed, like you did with halflingers and like I did with thoroughbreds. Yeah, like I am. Um, thoroughbred was my horse of dreams, and I was not going to even look at other breeds. I, I'm real interested in, in a conversation about gated horses. Oh, we should do a podcast on gated horses. Okay. Yeah. We'll save that because, for another day. Yeah, we'll save that for another day because okay. it is, they actually have two genetic markers that make them different. So they gate, quote unquote, naturally, because they have one or two of these gen genetic markers that I go, it gives them more gears. They can walk, trot, and canter, but they can also walk at the speed of trot, which are the gates. Right. But yeah, and people who like gated horses is because there's no suspension. They don't trot and canter and bounce. And so you can get a fast speed, but a very smooth ride. So they're very popular for trail riders. Yeah. People with bad backs love gated horses. Um, but we'll know, we'll do a podcast on gated horses. 
And, and so that would be, but even within the gated horses, there's got to be at least a dozen different gated breeds. Wow. So people, when I say people get one, they get narrow tunnel vision about a breed because mm -hmm. they've attached a picture to the breed. Yeah. But I go, oh no, there are individuals that you can have a scared, <laughs> anxious, flighty draft horse, and you can have a dead, broke, calm thoroughbred. And my Arab, actually, Arabs have this reputation of being flighty and spooky and fast. And I go, my Arab, who was given to me when she was a foal, so I didn't intend to get a young horse, certainly not a baby. And I liked Arabs, but she was given to me. And that's been the most bomb proof. Nothing bothers her. Slow. Getting her to go forward was the challenge. But absolutely bomb proof horse I could put any beginner on. Wow. And Arabs don't have that reputation. But I go, it's up to the individual horse. Like saying that a breed is going to be a certain way is not accurate. I go, they may have tendencies, genetic tendencies, but that doesn't guarantee the individual is going to match the breed tendencies. It's a complete wild card. And I go, some of the quarter horses in paints, which also have a reputation of being quiet and reliable, I go, when they go bad, they can be really dangerous. That's really interesting because I think this is a key topic because if we think in our head that it's breed specific for different personalities, that's when we get hurt. Yeah, because we don't see it coming. We're not reading the energy. We're not talking to the individual. Right. And it it's like, it, you're just sort of generalizing to the breed. And I go, there's maybe a little bit of truth to it because the breeding programs might be, like thoroughbreds are geared to race. They're bred to race. So they're genetically right. predisposed to galloping is easy for them for a mile or two right? Arabs, they're genetically sort of, it's easier for them to gallop for 50 miles. You know, the quarter horse can be really fast, but uh, for a quarter mile. Right. I go, so there's some truth to sort of the genetics of it, but when it comes right to down to buying your horse, there's an individual under those, you know, that overrides yes. whatever the genetics are. So, and it's like, I've had thoroughbreds that were dead calm, and I've had quarter horses that were explosive and unpredictable. And Pat Pirelli used to say, it was really funny. He would say, there's only one safe horse, right? Pause, a quarter horse. And people think, oh, he's pushing quarter horses. And he goes, the kind of horse where you put the quarter in the slot <laughs> and it sort of rocks you back and forth for 15 minutes. He goes, those are the only truly safe horses. <laughs> so every horse has the potential for every behavior yes no matter the genetics no matter the breed no matter the age no matter the level of training you really want to look at that horse on an individual basis so anything you want to add miss i have to have a half linker <laughs> <laughs> it's just so cute i know I know. And I still would probably be more prone to buy, say, another Arab or a thoroughbred than I would a paint horse. Like it's just those are kind of the breeds I'm drawn to. So everybody right. has that. But they at the are. end Everybody's of the day, got an eye for something they want. It's the same thing with buying a house. You've yeah. got an eye for something you, that you're interested in and you go from there. But realize that it's not just the paint on the outside that matters. Right. <laughs> Do we have termites? Do we have skeletons in the closet that might come out later? And you just have to, that's the potential for any horse. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to kind of recap the tips for buyers at this point, because we need to wrap it up. But the, as some professional advice on the podcast, as having witnessed, been on the receiving end of buying and selling, 
and a lot of clients having to go through that. Because my specialty as a trainer is dealing with the problems they discover after they own the horse. That's my specialty is to go in and help them through it. But they've already picked out their horse. I go, that's in your, that's in your hands. Unless if somebody is paying me by the hour, like a lesson, to just tell them what I see on the video or get on the horse, here's what I feel, here's what I would look at, here's the pros, here's the cons. You make the choice. But I'm just going to give them my professional opinion or my professional take on it. And whether that's the trainer, the vet, the farrier, the body worker, doesn't matter. But pay people for their advice and try to avoid commissions. Whenever possible, avoid commission sales. That is where the horse trading thing just got a bad name. Right. And even on a broker or trainer or vet, you can always ask for references. A good professional should be able to give you references. Yes. Right. Um, use an independent vet. So that's number one, get opinions, pay for the opinions, avoid commissions whenever you can Two, find an independent vet and do as thorough a pre-purchase exam as possible. Yes. And don't blame the vet if they miss something that was hard to find, right? Get a vet that isn't associated with the owner, the seller, the barn, get an independent vet, do a PPE. Spring for the x-rays and the blood work. Yes, please. (laughs) Spring for it. It's well worth the money. And that is a, it can be a deal breaker on horses, right? Um, Ask opinions. The, The people who want to give you their opinion on a horse you're looking at, your friend who thinks they know everything, but they only own one horse. No, not the person to take advice from. Ask the opinion of horse professionals who are busy horse professionals that have a good reputation, that have been there, seen it, done it. They've been inside the industry for years. Your neighbor, your mother-in-law, your friend who used to own a horse, your friend who currently owns a horse, but only one, not the person to take advice from. You can get their opinion or they can offer your opinion, but take it with a grain of salt. Right. Right. And then when you go to look at a horse for buying, what I always tell people is watch the horse being ridden first. Don't just get off. Don't just trust what they tell you about the horse and get on yourself. Insist that the horse be ridden so you see him doing whatever it is, walk, trot, canter, something simple, but hopefully with his most regular rider in his normal home environment. You want to see what does that look like with his known rider in his known environment, knowing that once you have a new owner in a new environment, it'll probably cut the quality of what you see by up to 50%. You're going to get half of what you see in that best case situation. So I tell clients never get on the horse first, ever. You want to see how is that horse handled? How is that horse ridden? What does it look like as, you know, the first phase of the sale? Then if you're happy with all that, go ahead and ask if you can handle the horse yourself and take your day in the life picture, right? Because if they get the horse ready for you, I even, if I tell some people, if it's possible, go catch the horse in the pasture for yourself, right? Now there can be liability things. They might ask you to sign a release. That's fine. But see what you could do that would really simulate what you're going to do once you buy the horse. Are you going to have to go out and catch the horse yourself, right? Are you, you're going to have to groom your horse, tack it up, pick up its feet, do the, you know, all of that basic handling because the basic handling can sometimes make or break the deal. Mm -hmm. I agree. Right. A horse that's hard to handle in the cross ties or get tacked up or pick their feet or groom them, a lot of horses get sold for that reason, Mm -hmm. right? So handle the horse yourself, ride the horse yourself, and try to simulate as best as possible your day in the life list. What you want to do at home, you have a chance to simulate it before you buy the horse. So simulate everything you can 
with your, like I'm handling the horse that I want to buy to see how does this horse respond to me? So if, if it's a good picture between the horse with the current owner or the current rider, great. Then you wanna see how does this horse respond to me as an individual and how do I respond to the horse? And again, if you have to pay uh, a holding fee or a deposit or an option fee, if you feel like you need to go back two or three times to look at the same horse, take the time to do that. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So having that day in the life simulation test, I think really shows, because a horse responds differently to every person. And people exactly. think of a trained horse is going to behave the same way for every person, like a, like a vehicle. And I go, no, they have thoughts and feelings. They're going to respond to what you bring to the table as 50% of their behavior or performance. So if you don't handle and ride the horse yourself at least once, you don't really know what you're buying because you don't know how the horse is responding to you. And if you can do that without the seller in the background telling you how to do everything, <laughs> if you sort of do it the way you would do it at home, you get a clearer picture of if that horse is a really good match for you or not. And all of that great advice, I go, hardly anybody follows it. They look at the horse. It's the right color. It's the right yeah, breed. It's, it's the right price. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if you've already done that and you own a horse, I go, take heart. We've all done it. <laughs> we have all done it. And it's like, you learn from your mistakes. And the thing I found as a horse owner and a trainer is I have learned the most from keeping the horse when we're going through problems. Yes. Instead of getting rid of instead it, of I become telling. a better, I become a better owner. And a much better rider, a much mm -hmm. better trainer. Uh, and having a horse from baby to 29 years old, that horse has handed me my ass more times than I can count. Same with my two girls. I bred them both. So, yeah. And I go, she has punched a hole in everything I thought I knew. And I've had yep. to step up to the plate, redo it, learn more, be better. And it really, to keep the horse that you're having problems with does make you a better horse person. And that's not a judgment if you're selling the horse and especially if there's a fear issue involved. Okay, if you can't work with that horse, then yeah. no, nobody is being served well. But if it's just an, an annoyance, I go, sometimes people try to sell their problems and buy the solution. And I've I, seen that a lot. I rarely find that that works out well. Unless you got a lot of money, I don't <laughs> No, even with a lot of money, I go, really? I don't think the price matters. No, I've, I've watched, watched people with a lot of money end up with a collection of pasture ornaments. Oh, wow. And not one of them was under $60,000. It doesn't matter. The amount of money you spend really does not matter. Yeah. Because you can get a good horse at a low price and you can get a horse that is riddled with issues, like you said, thirty thousand dollars, all these un, you know, hard to diagnose issues, or at a hundred thousand dollars. Right. If you, don't, if you don't do a PPE, that hundred thousand dollars is not guaranteeing that you now own a reliable Ferrari. Exactly. I go. It just doesn't guarantee it. Horses have thoughts and feelings, so all the training buttons can fall right the hell off. <laughs> I go. And the horse will default, most typically all horses default to the current level of knowledge of their owner and primary rider. Yep. No matter how much money you spend on them, they will default to that level of knowledge. And you might get good rides for about 30 days and then it starts defaulting down. Yep. Yeah. So I hope you guys find that helpful. We better wrap it up. Um Thank you for subscribing. We've had some new subscribers. Welcome. And please like, share, subscribe, comment. We love it. Love and the we, comments. Yes, absolutely. Or topics you want covered. 
Topics you want covered or questions you have, please do always put it in the comments. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. So thanks for joining us, you guys, on the Horse Geeks podcast. And we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.